Well, it is so much fun to celebrate those who have served here at CPC. Grateful for all that you do, for the ways big and small that you make this community meaningful and you make, uh, you make tangible acts of service um, like powerful in people's lives to offer them transformation, to offer them to step into something new and different for their lives. Um, one, of our, one of my favorite uh, groups of people that serve here at CPC are our elders, our, our elected leaders, those who uh, sign up for four-year terms to serve alongside of the staff and help us set direction and vision for the church and keep us, keep us on track and walk alongside of us and ask, God, what do you have for us as a church, and uh, one of our current elders, Chris, who's who's here with us this morning, um, a few years ago, Chris picked up a new hobby. Um, Chris uh, was an empty nester; he's semi-retired, and a friend uh, pulled him into making knives. He started making knives as a hobby. And now, uh, as far as I know, Chris did not know that he had a talent for making knives before this began. Um, But he was surprised, and we have been surprised, that he's actually quite good at it. And many of us have been on the receiving end of really amazing knives that Chris has made himself. Some of our favorite knives in our kitchen right now are ones that Chris handmade from scratch himself. And so he did not know that he had the secret talent of making knives, but God has surprised him with that, and he has used it to bless and encourage so many other people. And what I believe about every person in this room is that God will surprise you with how he desires to use you. God will surprise you with how he desires to use you. In fact, what we're gonna see this morning is that the calling of Jesus means that Jesus sees something in you that you may not yet see yourself. He sees something in you that you may not yet see yourself. Now, this is not a self-help sermon. This isn't about be the best version of yourself. This isn't about some uh, five-step plan uh, to be more holy or more righteous. This is about opening our hands to receive and believe that God has something in store for us that we might not see ourselves, that many of us receive messages about who we are and and believe stories about what's possible in our lives that may not be the same as what God sees and what God believes about us. And we're gonna see a story in the Bible today where that was true of one man named Zacchaeus. And so grab your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 19. Would love for you to have a Bible in your hands. There are a few Bibles in front of you. Would love for everyone just tracking along because we believe God's word has the power to stick with us, to transform us, that that long after this sermon is over, that God's word will have an impact in our souls. And so let's walk through this text together. Uh, Luke chapter 19, starting in verse one. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Pause right there. So, Jesus was at the height of his popularity at this point. Jesus had been traveling for three years. He's been preaching and healing people, and the crowds around him had grown and grown. And Jesus is coming through Jericho, and it was like, you know, like Taylor Swift's coming through town, and everyone wants to see Right? Everyone wanted to see Jesus. And so uh, this guy, Zacchaeus, he was no different. He wanted to see him. He didn't want to miss out on Jesus. And so Jesus is coming through, but Zacchaeus has a problem. The crowds are like the Macy's Thanksgiving parade crowded on the street. And he's a very short man. He cannot see over the crowd. So it says he runs ahead to a sycamore tree, which is along the path. And a sycamore tree would have been perfect for this because it had a low trunk, So even a short person could climb it. And it had branches that could support someone and it was shaded. And so if you can imagine like a wealthy tax collector might not want others to see that he's this fanboy of Jesus. So he thinks he's got some private protection sitting up in the tree. And so Zacchaeus finds himself looking for Jesus. And here's what you need to know about Zacchaeus. 
Zacchaeus is a wealthy tax collector from Jericho, which you read in the text. But what that means is this. Uh, he, he oversaw other tax collectors. Jericho was this really important wealthy tax district. And so we can assume that he was not just wealthy, but he was very wealthy and that he made a lot of money by doing things that others found unethical and inappropriate, that he had abused his, his power to take advantage of others. And on top of that, he was Jewish. And he was Jewish in Jewish lands, but they were occupied by Romans, and he worked for the Roman government levying taxes upon other Jewish citizens. And so the Jewish people thought people like Zacchaeus were no good traitors who had turned on their people and who were unfit to be a part of God's family. He was an outcast and a pariah. That's who Zacchaeus was. And so as we read the rest of this story, just know this is a story for all of those who might feel like they are unfit to be used by God. Zacchaeus was someone who was caught in a cycle of greed and self-reliance, and God's people wanted nothing to do with him. They thought he was hopeless. They had written him off. He was the least likely to be called by Jesus, and yet... Pick back up in verse 5. It says, When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, so clearly Zacchaeus wasn't very good at hiding. And also Jesus knew his name, right? Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. He has gone to be the guest of an outcast. He has gone to be the guest of a traitor. He has gone to be the guest of someone who's unworthy. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Let's pause there. Now, it's that time of year um, where there are tons of graduations and everyone's excited and there are tons of grad parties. And one of my favorite things is stopping by grad parties and getting to see people and hang out. And, and uh, so this weekend we got to go to a few of them. And one of the fun things about grad parties is you show up and you're like, oh, I, I didn't know they were going to be, oh, I didn't know they were going to be here. I didn't know they, I didn't know they knew that person. And it's really fun because you go, oh, well, they know this person and, and they, must, they must like them enough to invite them to the party. They're at least on good terms with them enough to invite them to the party. They're welcome. And so in Jesus' day, in in the ancient Near East, like hospitality and invitation to a table, invitation to, to a feast or a fellowship was a big deal. It meant that you approved of someone. If you, if you both invited someone and they accepted, it meant that, that you were associated with each other, that you were okay being in the same room, that you were uh, accepted and approved by each other. So it's a big deal that Jesus says, I want to go to your house. I will let you serve me. I will break bread at your table with a traitor. And this made a lot of people really angry. That Jesus this religious man who so many people were following, who so many people believed in, that he would sit down at the the table of a traitor and that he would show him that he is seen and loved and accepted. People were unhappy. But also imagine this. This was the last interaction, the last personal interaction Jesus has before he goes to Jerusalem. He's actually on his way to face the cross. This is the last personal interaction Jesus has with a tax collector. And the same man who goes into the house of a sinner to break bread will just days later go to the hill and face the cross on behalf of all of us traitors, all of us sinners. The good news is that Jesus meets Zacchaeus right where he is, but he doesn't leave him where he is. He meets us where we are, but he doesn't leave us where we are. He comes for all of us sinners, and he offers himself. He comes to those who have no hope. This is God's work throughout history, that no one is beyond God's love, that no one is too far to be reached. No one is too far to be used for God's glory in the world. So if you feel like Zacchaeus or worse, take heart. God sees you 
and he sees something in that you might not see yourself, but he loves you in spite of it and he will take you. He will walk alongside of you. He will take you where he wants you to be. He is calling every one of us the same way he calls to Zacchaeus and says, I'm coming into your life. And it changed everything for Zacchaeus. Pick back up in verse eight. It says, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Pause there. I mean, like, when my kids have candy and I decide to take a handful, I'm not, like, I'm not, like, doubling that portion and putting it back, you know? Like, I'm not, like, putting four times the amount back in. Look, don't miss how crazy this idea is. A tax collector who has spent his career cheating people has said, I will give away half of my money and then I will repay people not one time, not two times, not three times, four times, which is what he would do with the other half of the money, by the way. This is a crazy idea. This is a crazy promise from Zacchaeus. It is wild that he would even consider such a thing. What a powerful response. And it's meant to blow our minds. Like, this is a crazy, powerful reversal. It's, it's like the opposite of the end of a Lifetime movie. No one saw it coming. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> we don't even get the conversation, right? Like, fast forward to the, like, they've had a dinner conversation. We don't even get the conversation between Zacchaeus and Jesus. And I think that's part of the point. Like, we're not supposed to focus on, well, what did Jesus tell him? What did Jesus tell him so that he responded this way? No, no. Jesus saw him. Jesus loved him. He came to his house. He responds in what looks like a crazy way, but is actually a sacrificial response to the love of Jesus. And so by the worldly standards that Zacchaeus has been living by for decades, it, it's crazy. Who would respond this way? But Zacchaeus no longer sees himself that way because Jesus came to his table and sat with him and demonstrated that he sees Zacchaeus is worthy of love. And that changes everything for Zacchaeus. Like when you see yourself the way Jesus sees you, it will change how you do what you do. And so for Zacchaeus, it meant that it changed the way he viewed his job and his wealth. His job was no longer about cheating people and controlling people, but, but about blessing and encouraging others. His wealth was no longer about accumulating the biggest stack, but about helping and encouraging uh, and supporting those who had gotten the short end of the stick. See, the calling of Jesus may change what you do, but it may not change what you do. It may just change how you do it. Many of us are right where God wants us, and he wants us to learn to respond to his call and his love right where he has us. Because when you know that you're loved and you're not seeking to be fulfilled by anything else, it can transform the way that you're a roommate or a friend, the way that you're a coworker or a parent, the way that you're a boss or a company owner. Like those things start to get transformed by the love of Jesus. And that's what it means to be called. That's what it means to be called, that, that we do the daily things in our lives in light of the one who has called us. That's what it means to be called, that you do the daily things in your life in light of the love of the one who has called you. And we will find, just like Zacchaeus found, that when we open our hands to the love of God, that he will give us more than we could have ever held, to, held on to on our own. He will bring peace and wholeness into our souls. Pick back up in verse nine. Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Let's stop there. Salvation has come to this house, not because he gave his money away, 
That was a response to salvation coming to his house. No, in fact, you might have missed it. The most beautiful line in this passage is actually this. This man, too, is a son of Abraham. Now, why is that beautiful? Because Zacchaeus was a Jewish man, a son of Abraham by birth, who was living and treated as anything but. He was an outcast. He was separated. He wasn't whole. He felt it in his soul. He wanted something more. He had been alienated from God and from God's people. How could God possibly ever use someone that's so messed up? In fact, Zacchaeus' name comes from the Greek word Zacchae. Zacchae means righteous one. And so if you're reading this story and you understand, you're like, okay, he is the least righteous person in this story. He is the least righteous. And yet when he meets Jesus, when he knows the love of God for himself, when Jesus sees in him what he cannot yet see in himself, he then responds in maybe the first righteous way he's ever had in his life. He responds not because he's figured it out, not because he's smarter or stronger or more capable, but because he's responding to the beckoning, overwhelming love of Jesus. That when you see yourself the way Jesus sees you, it changes everything. And Jesus sees in you what you have not yet seen yourself. So we come before him and we bring our failures We bring our deficits. We bring our doubts and our frustrations. We bring our broken lives and we say, God, use it. Use it for your glory. Like no one was looking at Zacchaeus and going, what a generous man. Before he met Jesus, no one was looking at Zacchaeus and going, what a generous guy. And yet, in light of Christ, his life is transformed. Who he really is in Christ matters. Jesus sees it before Zacchaeus can even see it himself. Friends, because the gospel moves, we can be open to how Jesus sees us. We can receive it and we can respond in our everyday lives to accept his calling of the one who loved us first, who meets us where we are. He doesn't leave us where we are. Amen. Amen. And it's at this table, gathered around this meal, this simple meal of, of bread and a cup, that Jesus tells us who we are, that he makes us righteous, that he makes us clean and pure, that he takes away the sin that stands in the way of the calling that God has in our lives and reminds us, here's who you are. You are people of the body and the blood of Jesus. So on the night that he was betrayed, just days after he encounters Zacchaeus, Jesus sat at the table with his disciples. And after he had blessed the meal, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. It is for you. Take and eat. Do so in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my shed blood for the forgiveness of your sins, for your healing. Whenever you drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. And Christians throughout the ages have celebrated that whenever we eat this meal, whenever we eat this bread, drink of this cup, we are proclaiming the power of the living Jesus, his death and resurrection at work in our lives, that this is tangible and real and good for us to do together. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I'm gonna invite the servers to come get into place. Once the servers are in place, the ushers will come and release you by rows. You'll come forward and you'll take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup as the words are spoken over you. If you need prepackaged or gluten-free elements, they'll be available at the end of every station. But friends, this is where we taste and see that the Lord is good, where we taste and see that Jesus sees us and loves us right where we are. He doesn't leave us there. Let us eat and drink and be grateful.